Okay, this is my uh, second uh, lease version of the um, gearing and speed, um, road speed performance analysis for uh, motorcycles based on the gearingcommander.com database. Uh, this was prompted by some comments online, as usual. Uh, someone said, well, you know, the fact that the Ninja 300 makes 35 horsepower peak and the CBR 500 only makes 42 peak means there's, there isn't really that much difference between those two bikes in terms of performance. I said, oh, really? Well, let's go back and take a look at the gearing because you can always talk about the power, you can talk about torque curves, but you have to look at the gearing also because gearing basically leverages, someone said the other day, I saw this the other day, it was an interesting comment, gearing leverages the power. The higher the gearing, the more leverage. So the more leverage, the less speed. So you trade off speed here for acceleration given the same power. So here you have an R1 with much longer gearing than the CBR 500, and you have these 300 bikes, uh, the guys that own these bikes that love to say, I don't need a bike that can do 100 miles an hour in first gear. Why would I want something that can do 175 miles an hour on the street? That's way too much performance. Well, the problem is that you're only looking at the miles per hour. You're missing the acceleration altogether. Now, also, you're also missing the amount of shifting and crap that you have to do with these bikes. Now, now with the R1, definitely you don't have to do a lot of shifting to ride it on the street, even at low speeds. If you look at something like a Ninja 300, though, with uh, much far shorter gearing, you have to do a hell of a lot of shifting because you have to do freaking, you know, 6,500 RPM in first gear to even get that thing up to 15 miles an hour to a running pace. Okay, I've said this before about this bike that this bike is slow as crap. It's not that slow in a quarter mile, it's not that slow 0.60 compared to car, but it's slow in the sense that you have to really rev the shit out of it to get it to move. And you have to ride at higher gears than you want to. So if you look at the straight gearing versus RPM charts, you can see that the spread is fairly loose. It'll, you'll, it'll become apparent in a minute. We'll pl trust me, we'll look at plenty of these graphs. The spread is pretty loose. Note your top speed is only 100 and 110 at the top at Redline. Okay, uh, now you can talk about that 13,000 RPM peak all you want. That's fine. If you want to talk about that 2,000 range beyond the blue line, that's fine. Um, debate that if you want. But the major issue is, look, you're talking about 32 miles an hour at first gear at 11,000 RPM. Okay, looking at even the 650, uh, you're talking about 35 miles per hour in first gear at red line, but the red line is at 7,500 RPM. That's 25% lower RPMs. So now I'm gonna make these graphs progressively shorter. So we don't need to make the same points. You can start to see them. The difference between red line in first gear and red line in sixth gear is only 30 miles an hour. It's, it's half of the, wait a minute, is that right? No, it's, it's 70 miles an hour, okay? Okay, 70 miles an hour. Keep that ratio in mind that what you're getting from first to the sixth gear out of the gearbox, out of the engine, as we go through these graphs, okay? 35 miles per hour in first gear, 7,500 RPM is slow, but it's better than 35 miles an hour at 10,000 RPM in first gear, okay? Which is ridiculous. So if we look at so sort of a slightly older version of the sport bike of the 650, we see kind of the same thing. At 8,500 8, RPM, a little higher RPM at Redline, you're still hitting at 35 miles an hour, and you're getting now about 115 miles an hour out of it at uh, in sixth gear, okay? So the spread is a little bit larger, but you're having to work a little harder to get it in terms of having to ride at a little harder RPM, a little higher RPM. And trust me, yes, you can talk about the bike can do that RPM, it takes time to get to those RPMs and the engine wants to work harder to get there. So it's not as easy to ride, it, ride a bike at high RPMs as it is to ride at low RPMs. So looking at the 10R, which has far more horsepower than the Ninja 300. I mean, you're talking about like 160 horsepower peak versus uh, say 40, I'll even give it 40 horsepower peak. Um, okay, so it's four times the peak power. Uh, the torque ratio is, is just ridiculous, 15 versus 80 you know, 75, uh, even 60 would be four times. Here you're seeing 92 in first gear versus 187 in second, which is a, a, a two to one ratio, uh, much tighter gearbox, but much higher performance, much more power, but the power is being soaked up to a uh, degree in the transmission because it's so long. 
but you're still getting plenty of acceleration. So if you look at a 12 arm, a little bit longer legs, uh, 85 versus 206 um, gear. Uh, the red line at peak, uh, sorry, the red line at ARA is about the same 10,000 RPM. Doing a little bit better in first gear, but a little bit longer in sixth gear. Gives you a little bit broader of a power band, but this is um, slightly more power. Well, about the same power, considering that this bike is older than the 10R that I looked at a minute ago. They stopped making the, the 12R back in 05, 06. So let's look at something uh, a little bit more. Um, oops, we went back and put in another three. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do this, folks. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't mean to throw in the fact that at 11,000, it's only 32 miles an hour, and you're still talking about only 100 miles an hour at Redline in sixth gear, and that's a, a factor of three to one. Uh, but what does it mean? Well, it means that um, it's going to take a lot more time to get to the top. Our top. Uh, sorry, I don't know what that really means. Let's think. What does that really mean? Think about that as you go through the graph. What does it really mean if you have a large spread between the top speed in first gear and the top speed in sixth gear? Well, it means that first gear is geared relatively short compared to the other gears. And you're going to pop through that first gear relatively quickly. Certainly on a Ninja 300, you will. I know that from experience. So um, looking at a phaser, you can see that first gear is 83 miles an hour. And trust me, on a FZ1, man, that thing really moves. You know, when you, it has decent acceleration in first gear, and it just takes right off through first and second gear and gets going. But it's not quite as long as, as the R1. So the FZ8, not quite as long as the FZ1. Uh, not you don't get that quite that rush of speed with uh, in the first couple of gears, but it's still pretty good. Um, here the R1 is again, uh, basically providing you this all day power band in first and second gear. Uh, looking at a Gixer, which I thought was a little bit better uh, in terms of a street bike for a couple of reasons, it has a better turning radius, and it's lower in first gear than the R1. Um, just as a uh, different look at it, I put in these shift speeds. This is what happens when you shift it at red line in each gear. Um, you can see the broad nature of that shift band. You see it's a little bit tighter here for the 600, but you're still talking about 155 miles an hour in top gear versus 67 in second in a first gear, which is, I think, plenty adequate for most riders. I think the 600 is definitely enough bike a good all-around bike for most riders. Maybe the riding position is a little extreme, but I really like that bike. I think it handles well. Very snappy acceleration. Plenty of performance for most riders. Whereas you see the R, the um, 6R, maybe a little bit more moderate for most riders. Okay, so that might have been a little bit fast. I'm going to go back and hit some of the highlights. I, I also didn't uh, talk about the 750 here, um, which I think for a performance bike is a nice uh, moderate bike. See, now the problem is you can talk about bikes that are, for a given target performance, they're underperforming, they're a good hit on that target, and they're a little over or excessive, okay? So I think once you start talking about it, uh, advanced riders, you'd want something more like this level of performance that you're seeing in the 750. Beginner riders, I think you'd want something more like the level of performance you're seeing in a CBR 500, okay? And intermediate riders, I think you'd want something more like what you're seeing in a 650. You'd be pretty comfortable with that pretty quickly, okay? So the big issue here is, now, why would you want to start with anything less than this? Um, well, because you can't go fast at all, and you really just want a small bike that you can maneuver through traffic. I think that the five, the CBR 500 is like the slowest bike I would ever recommend for anyone in any condition, okay? This bike is barely fast enough to get out of its own way, in my opinion. Uh, I would never really feel comfortable recommending a Ninja 300 to anyone for the simple reason that it is just... It's, it's like telling somebody that they'll get a good deal on a computer if they buy one with a, a 50 gigabyte hard drive. You know, it's, it's just enough to get down the road. 
okay, fine, it gets 60 miles to the gallon, but obviously the uh, Honda 500 is also getting about 60 miles to the gallon. No reason to do, to suffer through that low level of power and performance for a bike that big that costs that much that is this freaking slow. I mean, it's just ridiculously slow. I would never recommend to anyone that they get this bike, not even as a starter bike. I would say that you might want to learn on it, okay? If you've never ridden before, learning on it is one thing, but I would never buy it. I would never recommend that you buy this bike. Take some classes somewhere where they offer a Ninja 300 or a Buell or whatever, some kind of low-end bike, and learn how to ride if you've never ridden before for a couple of weeks, maybe a week, maybe even a few days, you know, if you're talking about eight hour days, then buy something decent, at least, <laughs> you know, at least the CBR 500, at least an SC6, maybe even a Gixxer. I, I don't see a problem with someone buying a Gixxer as their first bike that they own, okay? But you're gonna have to remember that it is a cutting edge sport bike also, and then if you go out and ride it like it's a bicycle, I will say it will kill you, but you can kill yourself on it. But the thing is, you can kill yourself on any bike if you ride it like an idiot. The one thing you have to have on a motorcycle to survive, the one thing, is a, a respect for pain and broken bones, scraped skin, and getting crushed and getting run over. You have to have respect for that. A fear, a, a healthy fear of it. You can't just say, oh, I'm just gonna run around, blah, blah, blah. It's just like having fun except the 60, on a, on a dirt bike except at 60 miles an hour. That's how you get seriously killed riding bikes, okay? You have to be intelligent enough to realize that getting into an accident is a bad thing and not let yourself get into one. Not just recognize it, but also avoid it. And that's where I'm gonna say, that's the dividing line between any motorcycle or any performance vehicle, between sanity and insanity. A person who's sane recognizes the damage that they're facing and takes steps to avoid it short of not participating in the, in the event at all. Um, a person who's paranoid would never participate because they, they were like, oh, there's, I don't want to have a chance of getting into, uh, getting my bones crushed or whatever, so I will never do it. Now that's paranoid. People ride motorcycles all the time without getting into accidents, getting their bones crushed. So it's not like you can't do it without that happening. You, you have to just be in that middle zone and realize it's not how much, how fast you ride that's the issue. It's how fast you ride relative to something that gets closer to you. That's the issue. You're not gonna get hurt on anything if you don't hit anything, okay? So you really wanna make sure you don't hit anything, not necessarily that you don't participate in the first place or even that you don't go fast, but make sure you don't hit anything on a motorcycle and you'll be fine. That's the basic issue. So that should be enough. Okay, I really haven't covered yet why someone would want um, more of a bike either in terms of weight or power or performance, speed, acceleration, whatever, then um, the Gixxer 750 that I said an advanced rider would want. Um, so uh, really quickly, let me cover why. Um, obviously acceleration, you know, that's its own reward. Um, although yes, true, in the lower gears you run into a problem with too much power, too much acceleration, you simply, you can deal with that basically just by shifting to a higher gear or rolling back the throttle a quite right in the bike wide open in the first couple of gears, especially as you go up in the higher RPMs. So there are a number of ways to avoid wrecking a bike in that case. Um, but we're talking about low speeds now. At high speeds, now I can, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of riding a bike 150, 175 miles an hour. So the big bikes are, number one, they're a little bit more stable. Number two, they're not as hard to, t to turn as people want to make it out to be. Um, Third, they have a lot of low-end torque, which makes it easier to ride. It means you don't have to shift it as much uh, for a couple of reasons, because of the longer gearing and also because you don't have to rev it as hard because it, it makes more than adequate power at lower RPMs. Um, so yeah, you know, you're talking about the 12 and the 14 Rs, that's why people want those bikes.